All right, I need to lift more weights, apparently. <laughs> um, so first we have Carrie Grassi, and Carrie is the New York slash Northeast regional lead uh, for Zillions at WSP. I also know Carrie from many, many years uh, of her great work at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, so she's worked on a number of projects that I think she can draw upon today uh, on that. And then also right next to me is Holly Niebuhr, the CEO of AEI Consultants, a national property consulting firm. Uh, she also chairs the development of an ASTM guide for an assessment of physical climate risk and resilience for commercial properties known as the Property Resilience Assessment. So she's going to get down to um, some of the sort of uh, site scale resilience metrics. So we're going to talk about all different scales. Oh, look, there we are. Um, and if you're just wandering in, uh, this is the measuring resilience panel. We uh, switched with the 1 p.m. Um, slot. So if you're not in that, that that's, um, that's going to come later. So uh, just a few words. Okay, so we have a, a wonky graphic here. Um, this was uh, made by the, the great Ellis Calvin of Regional Plan Association as a, a part of a project we're, we're doing to try to explain what is a resilience metric. Um, I, I'm curious to hear sort of everybody might have a different definition of this and it'll be interesting to hear your definitions after this, uh, after this panel, but I think it's helpful to think about first, uh, uh, when we, we want to understand what is a resilience metric, we have many sort of measures of, of vulnerability, for example, a social vulnerability index, um, we also have measures of hazards or exposure to climate risks, uh, like a flood, flood risk layer. Um, and then we have, we, we want to really get a sense of what are the core attributes of a resilient system. So we have uh, physical risk, we have social risk. Um, what are the systems that support um, our society and our environment um, in, in light of climate change? So an example of that might be um, thinking about our electrical grid, and an indicator of that might be think thinking about how reliable is our electrical grid in the face of uh, climate impacts. So really thinking about these things as layering together uh, and many ways to sort of think about that. Um, and there are a lot of measures of vulnerability and s social vulnerability and burden um, and equity. So there's been some great progress. I just want to highlight the Biden administration, the White House's Climate and Environmental e Economic Justice Screening Tool. Uh, we've also got the states of New York and New Jersey have state disadvantaged and overburdened communities layers. And these are really, and then EDF has a climate vulnerability tool across the nation to really understand our vulnerability to different climate stressors across the nation. These are great tools for thinking about uh, prioritization of funding um, at sort of a large scale and understanding sort of how, how vulnerable our colleagues are to, um, our, our, our residents are to climate threats. Um, but why measure resilience? Um, I think part of, the <laughs> part of the sort of basic things that we're trying to answer are how resilient are we? How resilient is my neighborhood? How resilient is my neighborhood compared to their neighborhood? And how equitable is that? Or how resilient is my, um, my asset that I manage? Or in the case of the Port Authority, um, they've developed a really cool way to understand how at risk um, the, the port and the airports that we all rely on uh, are to, uh, to climate events. And they have a prioritization tool on that. So these are a few examples. Uh, we've got sort of report cards at the state level. Maryland has done a very qualitative, um, great sort of report card level. Um, and then uh, state of New Jersey has, uh, and, and city of New York have uh, some climate resilience indicators baked into some of their, their planning and, and program reporting. Um, we've heard a lot al about the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines or WEDGE program here today. And that is a really strongly uh, resilient system that looks at the asset or site scale. Holly's gonna talk a little bit more about that kind of scale. Um, and a big shout out to New York City for developing climate resilient design guidelines, which are also thinking about whether you're a school or a road, is it built to withstand climate threats? Um, and, and hopefully Carrie can speak to some of that as well. Um, and even, even to the point of budgeting, how, what is our impact on climate resilience with a specific piece of infrastructure or investment? Um, and how, how it, whether, you know, positive and negative are we doing there? Um, great. Uh, so I just want to shout out, and uh, I don't know if you can raise your hand, Ravina Pranand from Regional Plan Association. <laughs> Sorry to shout you out with a little, <laughs> you know. And Anushi Garg from Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, they're, they're some of the true leaders of, of this work. This is a project that we partnered on with the Regional Plan Association Environmental Defense Fund to try to get a, at the question of, at the scale of a city or a state or a neighborhood, um, really trying to get at uh, community-based and uh, sort of literature-informed 
um, resilience metrics that can be used to answer the question, how resilient are we? So uh, to do that, we uh, led sort of an iterative process with a, a lot of different colleagues that worked at the community level. We looked at community-based plans over uh, the entirety of New York City, I think more than 40 and more than 500 goals we took from those plans and synthesized them into the common themes that were, uh, w that were uh, present across all of those plans. And then really tried to identify and pair indicators that matched up with, um, with those different goals. Uh, we found a lot of consistency. One of the things that we found uh, when looking at those is just infrastructure is a huge focus of, of goals. And part of that, I think, is we all depend on it every day, but also it, w it really failed us during Hurricane Sandy. And I think a lot of those community-based plans were, were led after following Hurricane Sandy in response to um, governance is another sort of big area that, that people really focus on, and I think um, that was also because uh, the perspective at the time was that governance had perhaps failed us. We didn't really have a system in place uh, to effectively manage a, a storm like Sandy. Um, I'd say that's, that's uh, shifted a bit. We have now uh, had a, a new department, or a new um, bureau, sorry, under the Department of Environmental Protection and Lorian Farrell, who's going to speak later today. Um, that is really trying to get at that issue. Um, and then a huge focus on social ec and then some on ecological and economic. Um, great. Um, and then this is just an example of some of the indicators that we identified that, that could be used to match up against uh, some of those community-based goals. Um, and if you are interested in diving in deeper, definitely chat with uh, Anushi or Ravina after the, the session, uh, and we would love to sort of uh, build some dashboards on this. Um, so I guess I'm going to start out this panel by asking a question uh, and starting with Holly. Um, one, of, one of the questions that I think it, it's really helpful for, for us to understand is, you know, like, what, <laughs> what is resilience? Um, and, and why are metrics important? And I know you might have a few slides, so I'm going to just pass this on to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to stand just for the first part here because, you know, I know standards are super sexy. <laughs> yes? Who's with me? Standards are sexy. Okay, so I'm going to stand so I can make some eye contact with you in the back there. Um, so I am uh, here as an emissary from the commercial real estate finance world. So I have been supporting commercial real estate risk management processes for the last 20 plus years. And uh, a group of us got together and decided we needed a property resilience assessment. I'm going to explain a little bit about why. Um, but first, I want to see who knows what ASTM is. You've heard of ASTM? So ASTM has standards covering so many things, uh, materials testing and so on. It also covers assessment processes that are used when properties are being financed or sold. And so if you listen to the plenary, you heard Steve talk about the importance of resilience in finance. And you heard Camilla talk about how property values are really the bottom line. If we can connect resilience to property values, we can make a difference. So within ASTM, there are a number of assessments that are very common. And again, standards are sexy, right? <laughs> so <coughs> with almost every property that changes hands, when the banks on Wall Street are financing those properties, they are doing a series of assessments for every single loan. And always is going to be the environmental site assessment. The reason for that is environmental risk travels with the title. It uh, doesn't matter if you cause the contamination. It's your problem now if you own it. So people want to avoid that liability, right? So they, they get an environmental site assessment with every property that they sell by finance. That's important because the regulatory world in the, the United States could never possibly uncover all the contamination that's out there. Underground storage tanks, dry cleaners, all those things would have been left unfound were it not for the ESA being ubiquitous in commercial real estate finance. So you see the power of standards there. When property is assessed prior to being financed, we have a powerful system of standards. So why did ASTM want to get involved with resilience and climate risk? It's because the lending community and the investors who own commercial real estate are ultimately concerned about how much is this building worth? Is this building worth what I think it is? And if it's subject to significant climate risk, there's the physical damage, and there's also the insurability problem, which I know there'll be a panel on later. Um, so there are many reasons why the stakeholders were concerned and wanted to develop an assessment. 
We decided to focus our efforts solely on physical risk to the buildings. We know that that intersects very directly with broader resilience that we'll talk more about today on the panel, with the work of the Waterfront Alliance, with the work of so many of you in this room. It also intersects with ESG reporting goals of the large public companies who own a lot of real estate. And it also intersects with that due diligence process that I was talking about before. And of course, underwriting and risk management. So who was involved in developing this? It definitely wasn't me uh, alone. This was a lot of different stakeholders. Many of you probably in this room have folks that you work with that were involved. And together, and, and Waterfront Alliance was also involved, and thank you for your involvement. Together we developed this <laughs> really not that groundbreaking of a process. This is how most people approach this risk management effort, right? You're looking for what is the hazard, um, how can we evaluate the vulnerability of the building, and then how can we improve the resilience of that building? Um, to your question, which is how do we define resilience, we spent uh, probably, we've been working on this for three years, probably the first year and a half was really debating what do we want this to cover? And we ended up um, focusing on not only the damage to the building, because that would affect the property value, but also the recovery time. And when you think about the different types of properties out there, hotels, self-storage facilities, all those different property types, downtime is a big deal to value because your income on your property is a daily thing depending on the, the building. Um, so we spent a lot of time, we decided to incorporate damage, downtime, and safety in our considerations. Um, and ideally, out of that second piece there, you get a damage uh, value at risk because everything goes back to the property value, right? If you're trying to finance a $50 million deal, you want to know what is the potential impairment to the value, just like Camilla was saying in the plenary. Uh, and then the resilience measures, you get an idea of the order of magnitude costs for improving the resilience and then the benefit to the improved value, right? So it's all math because that's what commercial real estate finance wants. This is the same view of the, the process to show there that safety damage and recovery time are important considerations. So I know you're gonna ask this question, but just to uh, give a little bit of a hint, we initially wanted this to be a rating system because commercial real estate wants rating systems. They want things to be easy. When we encounter seismic risk in commercial real estate finance, it's very clear there's a threshold over which a certain percentage of damage is not okay. That loan will not proceed. That's what everyone wanted for commercial, for climate risk. We abandoned that effort <laughs> because it's so context dependent. What is the property type? Who are the occupants? What are the goals for recovery and value preservation? So we can dig more into that later. And just to wrap up the slides, where we are on this ASTM property resilience assessment, we are currently in the midst of balloting and will be completed soon. And if anyone's interested, please let me know. I can get you hooked up with the task group. And that's the end of the slides for me. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. I, I'm gonna pivot over to, to Carrie. And I'm wondering if you can, yeah, I know, it takes <laughs> some strength, right? I know you were laughing at me, but now you understand. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work out after the, uh, the panel. Um, yeah, so I, I think it would be great to hear from, from, <laughs> from Carrie uh, to talk about just both your definition of resilience and also any models or frameworks that you find that are particularly um, effective. Sure. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Grassi. I am um, currently at WSP as the regional lead for re resilience, um, but I've spent the past um, 10 years uh, at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice working on resilience issues in New York City. Um, and so I think actually this question of what is resilience is actually kind of at the heart of why coming up with metrics is so difficult. Um, um, so the, the sort of definition that I think a lot of people are familiar with, right, the capacity to prepare, prepare for, respond to, recover from, adapt to climate impacts, right? There's a lot in there um, and a lot of very different types of things in there. So if we're measuring success, um, we have to think of all of those aspects of measuring. Um, in addition, I think, right, resilience is a process. Um, we're working in a dynamic environment, um, a changing environment. There's really no 
end to resilience. You don't say, okay, I'm resilient now, I'm done, I don't have to do anything else. Um, so it makes kind of measuring your ultimate end goal very difficult because you're working in this sort of changing atmosphere. Um, and it really requires, I would say, kind of a, a holistic and multidimensional approach um, to enhance communities, right, social, natural, physical, financial capacities um, to recover and cope with climate impacts. So again, when you're thinking of metrics, thinking of measuring, right, you want to make sure you're measuring the right things, that there's some logic there. Um, and so coming up with that suite of metrics that, that addresses all of those different um, variables um, is, is quite difficult. That said, right, measuring is important. There's that old saying, right, like what gets measured gets done. Um, and um, it's, it's important to keep government accountable. Um, it measures progress, it uh, provides benchmarks, um, it helps justify expenditures, right, to say we are making progress, we think we should expend more money um, to achieve this, this goal that we've set. Um, and it also kind of put a puts actions in context, um, which then can lead to more effective engagement um, and communication with the public about why you're making the choices. I'm speaking from government's perspective here, why you're making the choices that you're making, um, which sometimes, you know, again, might be difficult to understand because there are a lot of trade-offs when it comes to resilience planning. Um, you wanted models too? Uh, just maybe an example or two. Of yeah, things, sure. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, there's, uh, we're sort of at a moment now, I think, where, where there, uh, post Sandy, there was a lot of funding coming in, a lot of sort of work to implement, and we're kind of at a moment where <laughs> a lot of people are needing, we really do need to measure. How, how, how do we know that we're, that we're more resilient? Um, and so there are a couple of initiatives that are going on um, in the city, and I think, you know, one of them is very kind of asset-based, sort of as, as Holly described in a very similar process. Um, and Kate mentioned the, the city's climate resilience design guidelines, right? And that is looking at standardizing the process for risk assessments um, in order to sort of make sure that whenever there is a city capital expenditure that climate impacts um, climate future is being taken into account in the planning and design um, of those city assets, whether that's buildings or pieces of infrastructure. Um, and so there is a initiative to um, kind of make those standards required for city agencies come 2026. So the city's going through a pilot process right now to both standardize that risk assessment uh, procedure but then also to come up with um, a bunch of metrics um, to make sure that, that, that we're achieving the goals um, or that the city is achieving the goals they stated. It's that, that metrics deliverables that is sort of the, the trickiest part of this and I think is, um, is happening now. Um, there are a few other models of kind of broader, you know, um, uh, portfolio investments, right? So. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget um, has started climate budgeting, um, looking at um, the entire city's investments and, you know, do they contribute to both mitigation and resilience, and then how do we measure that? Um, it's interesting, again, this is very much sort of a new thing. Um, the city is um, part of a consortium of, 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 of a learning group with C40, cities around the world are sort of grappling with this. Um, so um, it's very much kind of a, a, a work in progress figuring out how do we actually measure this stuff. Um, I think the initial um, uh, approach to resilience, and I think this will evolve over time, is yes, no, right? does this project contribute to the resilience goals of the city, yes or no, or partially, right? And so um, as, as climate budgeting gets more sophisticated, I think those analytical approaches will get more sophisticated as well. Um, but those are some examples. Thank you for that. And I, I kind of look forward to maybe when we grow up a little bit in our, in our space um, 
to, to where the greenhouse gas mitigation uh, reduction field is. We now got letter grades on our buildings for how, how much we're sort of impacting uh, climate change based at the building scale. And wouldn't it be great if we were also thinking about resilience and had a way to do that? And I think the city's climate resilient design guidelines is a way, great way to start. I have an ask of the audience. There's a few empty seats in this row. And if it's not too much trouble, I'm wondering if those could just shift down one so that those that are standing up can, can come in. Um, thanks so much. Um, and I, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and also, I failed to introduce myself. I introduced the panel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate. I work for Environmental Defense Fund now, but I used to work here. Um, I, I used to work at building the Rise to Resilience Coalition and also uh, adapting Wedge into a national, uh, nationally applicable standard uh, with some colleagues, Sarah Doherty, uh, and many of you. So it's really great to be back amongst old friends and also just seeing how, how these programs have grown uh, and, and get to work with, with you all every day. Um, so quick uh, shift, shift back, I, I wonder if w you talked a little bit about the, the property scale, Holly, and when I think about property scale, I think about insurance. How does, um, how does this system or systems in general work with insurance and how should it? Easy question. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because when we started this effort a few years ago, it was really in advance of kind of the SEC climate risk. Uh, disclosures, you know, any of the public companies that are thinking about preparing for SEC or uh, that we report to GRESP, for instance, they have to disclose what's the physical risk in their portfolio and how are they managing that. So that was the first interest in this standard, but it has really shifted over the last couple of years to a property insurance focus because property insurance has become more and more difficult and more and more expensive to obtain. So people are now ordering these property resilience assessments to give to their insurer to say, hey, I implemented these resilience measures. What you're seeing in your model doesn't bring this forward, so I'm giving you this report to show it. Um, and I think one thing I wanted to make sure this audience is aware of is, is the commercial real estate uh, huge marketplace of commercial um, climate modeling solutions. Um, if you're not familiar with the Moody's and the Munich Re's and the uh, RMS's and I guess that's Moody's now, um, climate check, risk footprint, uh, <laughs> all up First Street Foundation, this is a huge like arms race of climate risk data. And it matters because large lending institutions, Wells Fargo, Chase, city, they're all obtaining this information and thinking about how they're going to use this information to make decisions. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the challenges. It's a, it's an opportunity to make our communities more resilient because, the m you know, follow the money, right? If the money's looking at it, the money cares about it, uh, insurance cares about it, that would um, ideally provide incentives for buildings to become more resilient. Um, however, it also presents some challenges if capital is being restricted to certain communities because they're subject to higher climate risk. Yeah, I, I think there's both opportunity and it scares me a little bit just to think about how some of those climate models are being used um, by the financial industry to think about where to invest and where to disinvest. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, just sort of speaking a little bit about equity and, and pivoting a little bit to um, thinking about um, just, you know, how do we, I, I know we talked about sort of not standardizing, right? We, there's this both this need for standardizing, but also a desire to tailor, right? And that was a challenge that you highlighted. Um, I'm wondering if, if Carrie, you know, just thinking about the climate resilience design guidelines, or maybe another example, um, how do you how do you think about sort of measuring resilience for, say, a subway tunnel versus like a home scale? You know, like how do we make these metrics sort of accessible to different different scales and and, and targets? You know, I, I think that's a, a, a huge challenge. I think it's, um, you know, as difficult as it is, it's easier to, to sort of look at the resilience of an, of an asset, right, um, or, or, a, or a home. Um, but when you're looking at kind of a, a neighborhood, <laughs> right, how does everything kind of add up, right? How do you sort of bring in that, that social, environmental, um, those, those aspects uh, uh, of it. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how we've, we, we haven't crack, cracked that yet um, because I think some, so much of this is location specific as well, right? Your risk profile changes um, 
from place to place in New York City, never mind, right, New York to Miami to Jakarta to um, wherever you are in the world and the type of risks that you're experiencing, the, the physical um, environment that you live in, what is technically feasible in order to <coughs> sort of mitigate those, those climate risks, and then the kind of social, cultural, um, um, environmental fabric, right, that we all live in. And so um, this desire to sort of standardize, I think, right, is, is helpful, but I, I, I think it, to, you don't want to lose the local context and the ability to kind of respond to the local needs and desires. And you know, I'm sort of interested from your work with community, right, because there are a lot of goals that um, community have, things that they may want measured, um, and that may differ community co to community, although it sounds like you found some, some um, consistencies across those spaces as well. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that, yeah, the, the, the challenge is really sort of what do all of these, these actions, how do they add up to a, a larger whole, and how do we measure not only the, the physical resilience of a space, but also the, the kind of social resilience? I don't know, Polly, you want to add anything to that? Before we okay. Um, next question is just really thinking about challenges that policymakers and practitioners uh, face when trying to implement these in a practical level. Um, I'm wondering if you can draw upon just a story or an example that sort of illustrates that challenge based on your experience. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start with um, Carrie again, and then we'll, we'll pivot over to Holly. Well, I, you know, I think one thing that you learn when you're in city government is that each agency has its own personality, right? They, they do things kind of their way in a way that makes sense for their assets, um, um, for their goals, um, and that, that translates into processes and procedures. Um, and so when you're trying to standardize a way of reporting or of evaluating something at a very basic level, Right, that means you have to work with agency folks to figure out how that fits into their existing processes um, or how to shift their existing processes to fit into this, this new approach. Um, and so I think that, that in and of itself is one of the challenges of, of kind of building the climate resilience design guidelines, building climate budgeting, making sure that there is capacity making sure that the procedures, the standards, et cetera, are um, um, available um, at city agencies to be able to meet that challenge, right? Um, you can sort of say, you must do this, but if they don't have the staff, they don't have the resources, they don't actually have the, the procedures in place, you're not gonna be successful. Um, uh, so I think, you know, really kind of working on those issues from the ground up um, to understand sort of where are we where are we trying to get to what is going to be feasible for these <laughs> for, for these agencies to even participate in a process like that is, is is critical so I think some of the challenges we encountered in developing this this guide um, were that it's multi-hazard so when we talk about climate risk the multi-hazard aspect is really challenging we have you know, flood people coming together with wind people coming together with drought, you know, high heat, um, and everybody has ownership of it in some sense. And so getting those folks to all work together on what is common amongst all the hazards. Um, but I think the biggest uh, challenge I see is, like I was mentioning, that kind of commercial black box nature of the climate risk mapping uh, and modeling companies and the finance industries inability to handle uncertainty. There is so much uncertainty in these, especially when you bring it down to the asset level. But in commercial real estate finance, everyone just wants an easy answer, like, well, how much does this damage the value of the property? I just need to know a number so I can put it in my pro forma. Um, people just want a number, but there's so much uncertainty baked in. So I think that that was one of our other big challenges. Um, but also I would say the interconnection between community resilience and asset level. Um, we spent a lot of time debating that, and there were many folks in our task group even who were like, you can't say an asset is resilient. It's like saying your elbow is a banana. Like, it, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Resilience is a systems thing. Um, so we really struggled with how do you balance the uh, 
considerations of the community and all the lifelines and um, the preparedness of the community and so on with what a property owner needs to know um, so that they can do what they can do for that building and hopefully do some good, but also know that they're interconnected to everything else. That's such a great point, and it, it brings to mind when we were developing the waterfront energy design guidelines or uh, adapting them sort of nationally and thinking about how to many different cases, typologies for how you might explore what what's possible and how to measure. Um, and one of the things that I found really challenging was that a lot of the, the way that we uh, model climate science and all of the information that we have is maybe at a, at a planning scale. Um, so you look down at a map and you can see where the flood hazard is. But it's not really brought into sort of like, well, then what do you do on a property scale for a park that you're building? How do you want to make sure that your park is lasting uh, through 2050 and beyond? And so I think I've seen a lot of growth when we were working on WEDGE, when the city was working on the climate resilient design guidelines at the same time, and even in the other sort of, m sort of maybe more massively well-known lead uh, in Envision, where we're kind of working on this and now have sort of standards for that. So I'm optimistic. Um, but I do think that that, I that sort of thinking about the system and how do you ask questions about the, the property scale um, that get at, well, you know, is there a transit system that's connected and is also going to withstand a 2050? And I think that those are questions that um, the city it itself is, is asking right now as they think about uh, where to prioritize and develop a, a buyout program for the city and how to think about that um, and make it equitable. Um, all right, next question. Uh, I'm thinking a little bit about just making sure that we, uh, you mentioned community carry, and making sure that we ensure community needs and perspectives are included in the development of metrics, um, but also that they're, they're sort of, you know, how do, we, how do we make sure that this is transparent and that they, it's accessible so that um, folks can actually um, answer that question, how resilient am I? It's a question that I've seen in a lot of community meetings um, even uh, from a perspective, well, who's getting the money? Is it, is it Manhattan? Uh, and that question came from Coney Island, Brooklyn. Um, so I'm wondering if you, you can just talk about so maybe some of the ways that we are um, and, and maybe some of the ways that, that we should be um, making sure that these are ac accessible and also um, developed in, in partnership with communities. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think, right, be because metrics you need to be measuring right what your what your you've set your goals out to be right. You you're trying to achieve these goals, and so how do you measure that you're making progress? So, community perspective um, has to be embedded in the goals to begin with, um, in order to even sort of set the, the the platform or the framework to then measure that right. Um, and so I think, right, there is a, a real sort of need and impetus to include um, community in that initial goal setting um, to make sure that those perspectives are in there so that that, that then trickles through. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the process of setting the metrics themselves and sort of figuring out what are we measuring um, maybe gets a little bit wonkier and maybe is sort of harder for um, community to engage with um, given everything it's asked of community to engage with. Um, but I do think that there's Im an importance because right, ultimately you're trying to measure what the impact is, what happens on the ground. And so you, I think it's really important to engage community in are these the right metrics? Are they are they really showing us kind of what the impact in your life is? Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that that is um, uh, something that the the folks leading the, the CRDG are kind of grappling with is um, you know what is the right time to kind of engage community in that process because you also want to be respectful of people's time. Right, and not sort of say, what's what should the metrics be? <laughs> but sort of have some thinking done, but then bring it out before it's fully baked, right? That's sort of the sweet, sweet spot, I think, of, of a lot of community engagement processes um, is really um, setting up a, a process for that engagement that is, mean, that is meaningful. Um, and I think that like, that equity, again, has to be stated as a, as a goal um, for resilience, um, if, that is, if that is what we are actually trying to achieve here. And then not just sort of equity as this, um, 
uh, sort of amorphous thing, but what do we actually mean by that? And there are a few different ways of thinking about equity. You can think about procedural equity, right? So, so um, how are people being engaged? Are they being engaged in a meaningful way? And if procedural equity is something that we're setting out to do, right, then you, then you can measure or you can attempt to measure, it's very difficult, but the, meaning, the meaningful engagement, right, and that sets that framework up. Distributional equity, right? Are we, are we sending our resources to the places that need it most? Um, Justice 40, right, the federal program um, to send 40% of, of all federal investments to disadvantaged communities is an example of that. They set a goal and that's, and that's now measurable. Um, and then structural uh, equity, right? How are we institutionalizing the accountability in government um, and making it transparent um, that we are sort of doing these things and, 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 and um, uh, holding, holding government to account um, on those principles? That's helpful. And, and one, uh, just one sort of piece of that that I would love to see more is distributional equity, not just measured in terms of how we're distributing our resources, but also how well the systems in each neighborhood are, are serving the communities that they need, their electric, their, their subway system, um, and how that is distributed across uh, geography. I don't know if you want to speak to this issue. Really. I mean, again, I'm, I'm sort of like an emissary from commercial real estate finance, so it's a, it's a little bit, I'm an odd duck in the room, but I would say, you know, when we think about old school environmental justice and like, contaminated sites not receiving financing because banks didn't have the capacity to finance contaminated sites because they didn't want to take those properties back and be held liable for those impairments, right? The same thing will happen with climate risk and resilience unless we are very uh, thoughtful about how we set up our risk management processes. So I think for those of you in the room that aren't associated with commercial real estate finance, for you to just be aware that this is happening right now, banks are trying to figure out how to incorporate climate risk and resilience into their risk management processes. And there's a very real potential that this um, exacerbate existing disparities in finance to communities. So things like Community Reinvestment Act are really important. But um, I think there's just so much more work to do. And I know the commercial real estate finance community is aware of the potential equity dangers. But I, I do fear that the, the dollars will speak louder and we could run into some issues. OK. Um, I'm being asked to pivot. So no, 10 more minutes. Oh, we used a lot, the wrong one last <laughs> time. OK. Wrong, like OK, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. I was speeding it up, Tyler. I'm going to have to come up with new questions. Um, that's all right. Well, actually, I, I do want to dive into that a little bit. It's, um, I, I don't know if we, we have the, the full um, you know, expertise to, to really tackle this issue uh, today, but I'm just I'm curious, um, Carrie, if you've thought about this at all. I mean, I went to, uh, there was a really good managed retreat conference mm. last year. And there was a panel of uh, these these analytics firms, um, and one of them was basically just talking about how they. Sorry if you're in the room, but um, cl their client was BlackRock, and they were basically telling them where to invest and where to disinvest. And everybody in the room would just their jaw dropped. And of course, we kind of know this, um, but I'm just curious, what do we what do we do with that um, to prevent that worsening of inequities? I think there's a lot of great programs we heard from CEQ. I see. Um, uh, also, our NOAA representative uh, th today talking about some of the investments that we're making, uh, and a, a, a colleague in the outset also talked about the need for retrofits. But um, how do we, <laughs> how do we stem that tide or deal with it so that we aren't worse off, or even you know ideally better off than we were uh, from an equity perspective? I don't know if no, no, uh, Carrie, are you ready to start <laughs> start talking about that a little bit? Um, <laughs> Um, if anybody has ideas, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what to do about the, the private investment side of things. I, I do think from the from the government perspective, it's r it's really really important to understand the history of um, urban renewal, of um, redlining, of um, um, all of these sort of government sponsored processes um, to um, you know, move people to disinvest, um, and and you know, really create 
a people first, um, I would say, process for um, giving people the, the, the information and the tools to be able to make decisions for themselves about um, whether what their risk tolerances are and whether or not they're ready to leave their neighborhoods or not, right? Um, it's a very personal decision where you live, um, and there are a lot of people who are ready to leave, um, and they should have the resources and the tools to be able to do that if they if they want. Um, and you know, for folks that aren't ready, um, I think there should be um, sort of a, su a support system um, to give people the information and the tools um, that they can make those decisions for themselves when they are ready. Um, but sort of government, I don't think, should be adding to the uh, equation of saying we're going to start disinvesting in this neighborhood um, um, because we see we see this this risk. Um, it's really tricky. I don't I don't have the answers, um, um, but but I know that you know the city has really sort of tried to reframe this issue as it away from managed retreat and more towards towards housing mobility. This is a this is a housing mobility issue. Um, 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 and it's wildly complicated. <laughs> yeah, and I was just going to add, I think there is a lot that the insurance industry can do, and I see Kate still well here in the audience, and parametric insurance and different creative solutions for insurance are part of the solution. Um, I think some of us are maybe heading to the NIBS conference later this week in D.C., where they do a lot of research about incentivizing resilience, which, um, you know, the plenary Camilla's research, I think, really touched on that as well, is lenders need to uh, incentivize it through better um, lending rates for uh, improving resilience projects. Um, cities need to incentivize it to make their communities more resilient. Insurance needs to be part of it. Um, programs like commercial PACE uh, programs can be really helpful. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD. HUD has a massive amount of funding going out for green and resilient retrofit programs. So I think it is a collaborative effort, um, and I know people are aware of it. I Just like I said, I am concerned because these very large banks are using these types of models, and I'm not sure if they understand the implications. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one, one thing that's, that strikes me as, as an opportunity is, uh, you know, all these sort of pieces are, are happening a little bit independently. I think um, there's an opportunity the state just committed to a statewide resilience plan in the state of New York, um, you know, incorporating the financial considerations and thinking transparently about what, um, what, do we, what do we do to mitigate that risk, um, I think is something that can be incorporated into resilience planning so that it's transparent and forward-looking and, and that we have a strategy for that. Because I really don't think we, we do at this, at this point in time. And sort of to the point of insurance, I just want to shout out, um, if you know me, you know that I love, love shouting out to colleagues, but uh, Carolyn Kuski at, at Environmental Defense Fund is working on, uh, in partnership um, with the, the City of New York and many others, um, on an uh, inclusive insurance pilot in New York City to automatically pay out uh, low-income um, bank renters and homeowners um, upon a, a triggering event. Um, so that's something that uh, I think it was also mentioned in the beginning panel is different models for sort of having having options for people to quickly recover. Um, I think I'm going to softball and then I'm going to pivot to the, the audience. Just, you know, what are the sort of next steps if you want to get to the, the future that we really want to see uh, that we might need to take to advance this, this field a little bit more? And uh, I'll just start with Carrie. Sure. Um, yeah, I think you have to start somewhere, right? This is hard, but you have to start. Um, I was speaking with a colleague the other day and was reminded um, just sor sort of about the evolution of. Um, um, energy audits and benchmarking, right? In 2019, there uh, 20 sorry 2009, um, there were local laws mandating audits and benchmarking, and the data was messy. It was inconsistent at first, um, and over the years, right, it evolved. It became more sophisticated. Ten years later, in 2019. Um, with a really strong data set, the city was able to really take the next step in mandating um, emissions limits um, uh, through Local Law 97. So, you know, it's a process. You have to start somewhere. Um, and I would just say, I think 
when you're starting, right? We need to keep it meaningful, but can kind of keep it simple, um, and it can it can grow from there and evolve from there. Yeah, and I think similarly, um, as I mentioned, the environmental site assessment process that has evolved over the last 30 years, which has resulted in all these environmental impairments being addressed and dealt with because they were being financed or changing hands, we'll see the same thing happening with climate risk and resilience. And all of the, there are many design firms, I know, I at this conference. Beyond design firms, there are companies that just do assessments. And all of these companies are trying to figure out how to provide these assessments. So I think it's very powerful that if this was considered with every transaction, it would be assessed. But will it be assessed correctly? To Carrie's point, um, mm -hmm. we need to keep it simple but also meaningful. And I think um, we're really at this pivot point right now where it could be distilled down to a rating that some kind of climate modeling provides and uh, we could lose some of that intelligence that comes from being on the ground, talking to the building occupants and really understanding the asset. We're going to pivot to audience questions, so get them ready. But also, if you have ideas, especially related to maybe uh, examples of frameworks that have worked for you, um, or also of, of how to solve this inequity challenge um, that that metrics might might sort of help um, propel in, in certain ways. Um, Julian, I know you, so I'm calling on you first. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Um, so to sort of repeat the question, um, Julian, uh, it, it was trying to understand um, how we kind of translate some of the resilience benefits into actual financing of projects um, and who is not in the room today that, that should be. I'm, I'm not sure we can answer that question yet. <laughs> but I think I would just love to see more interaction between uh, the pi private and public sector. And I would love for, you know, I go to a lot of the commercial real estate conferences and it's a lot of blue blazers and <laughs> it looks very different from this room. And those folks need to be meeting all of you. Uh, there needs to be more intersection there. Um, I do think that they're starting to understand the importance of climate risk because the Federal Reserve is telling them that it's uh, financial risk, right? So I think, I mean, it, it's happening. It's just, um, will it move in the right direction? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do think HUD's GRRP program is really important. If Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac could take a similar uh, approach, that could be really powerful and other lenders may follow. Also, I think the lender, the, the global lenders that are subject to European uh, sustainability regulations will be motivated to offer financing to incentivize resilience to help themselves, you know, look better. But if, if we can take advantage of that, we can do that too. Can you, can you quickly tell people what the HUD GRRP is? Green and Resilient Retrofit Program. A uh, ton of money going out and they're actually directing that money towards the properties that are in the least great condition. For both energy efficiency and resilience, it's first, first, uh, okay, got it. Ka Carrie. Uh, oh, this way. <laughs> uh, next question. Also, Julian works at the Federal Reserve, so there you go. Oh. And shout it out, we didn't even know. Um, next question. Yes. Um, uh, my name is Kate Stilwell, and um, I want to ask the panel um, you know, the reason this room is so packed is that metrics can be the holy grail that's going to unlock all these natural market forces to be able to accelerate the pace mm -hmm. of resilience um, of infrastructure. So, and not just infrastructure, but building by building, asset by asset. Mm -hmm. And so in order for the metrics to become this common currency to make mm -hmm. this market, um, what are the additional not just intermediaries to the budget, but then the after the fact um, processes to be able to um, make it a fair process? So like, mm -hmm. you, I love what you said, you both said at the end, that you have to start somewhere. And you know, we have to go out of the gate with some process or metric, but like, and I love how you said what we're learning from these other um, set, these other processes like um, environmental reports. What is the appeals process? What is the auditing process? What is the 
the regulatory process? What is the process mm -hmm. of in, uh, uh, congressional judgment and liability that goes along with that? Mm -hmm. What are all these additional layers and levers that will make it a complete, transparent, and fair process? Oh, sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have a, again, using environmental as, a, as an example. So environmental site assessments became um, required under CERCLA law um, as a way to prove innocent landowner status. So when you buy a piece of property, if you do a phase one environmental and then a problem is found later, you can say you're an innocent landowner because you did your due diligence. So there's a legal framework that's set up, blessed by the EPA, blessing this ASTM standard. The ASTM standard is a consistent reporting across the industry. And things like Commercial Real Estate Finance Council use the phase one in their investor reporting package so it goes through if you're securitizing a bunch of loans, you get to see what the ESA result was. And I know the CREFC is looking at what climate risk information and resilience information would be in the IRP similarly. Um, so I think it is, uh, having a standard is great. Um, I think to get down to a, like a grading scale for buildings is going to take a very long time and could be very problematic. Uh, quickly, sort of not answer, but um, maybe <laughs> conti continue the conversation and step a little bit out of my field. So uh, here goes. Um, I think one of the things, and I don't know if you're getting, you know, your Neptune insurance, um, you've been trying to solve this problem. Um, and I, I think when we were developing the waterfront edge design guidelines, really trying to understand that sort of unlocking the capital and what are these financing tools that can help fix this problem. Um, and it, right now, w we don't have a great system plan for how the different uh, return on investment of those things kind of fits together. And when you think about how to make, you know, do that, even just using insurance as an example, right now we only have sick people in the system, if you're thinking about like the healthcare <laughs> um, comparative, and we have this system of like 50 different states with different roles, right? Um, and it obviously gets very hairy, um, but if you, if you really want to do something in an equitable way, you have to think about it at a large scale and how these systems uh, fit together and, and either do or don't serve people. Um, and, and so I think there needs to be a lot more thinking at that scale of like, and maybe even piloting at the city scale, what would an inclusive insurance um, program look like or a state um, that, that does kind of address everyone. It floods everywhere <laughs> in the state. At Rebuild by Design did a great report um, showing how many disaster declarations have been in s every single county. Um, so how could we structure maybe a pilot program at a state level that um, that even addresses one of these issues, insurance or, or thinking about some of these financial um, measures. But if you, if you do that for New York City and then a neighboring county, um, you know, to use the financial example, if you want to like finance um, Battery Park City's <laughs> investments in resilience, right? Um, maybe a, another neighborhood can't can't do that. So that that goes back to that question of scale and and how do you get to that distributional equity? Um, I might be talking a little abstractly, so I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that before we go to the next next question. Sure.
know what they are. We don't know how to deal with them just by themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and we know they have to come. We can't do it. We don't know how to do it. So we'll start with the basic stuff. And related to that, time now takes the stuff that is equal in the same way. So that with your structure, whatever it is, would not be the limit characteristic in the same way that it has to not fall down. And it's just, it's not going to have to fall down. And then you don't need to have it's okay, you know, the engineers have said, this is what it takes to be in the green, and it's to me okay, but it's I think that's enough to take us home. Uh, there's a few <laughs> questions in there, and some great ideas. I don't know if uh, Carrie or Holly would like to start. No, I just, I think that's exactly the right observation. Um, and, you know, um, the, the, the building code and just on your last point, the CRDG is, is, is sort of trying to do exactly that. Uh, uh, you know, um, so I think you're, you're right on, you're right on. Yeah, I agree, codes are really important um, and perhaps the current insurance markets are pressuring finance and others to think about why they would want codes to be more consistent and higher level across the US. Um, because it would be in their benefit and follow the money, money cares about it, maybe it'll happen. Um, I will say on the property level, the way we had a lot of debates in our task group about preparedness and community in the context of the building itself and um, something that's very common in our world is operations and maintenance plans and making sure everyone on the building knows what they're doing. So we did touch on it a bit, but certainly not to the extent that you mentioned. And I don't know if you were here for the, the beginning, but when we were looking at um, uh, some community uh, sort of preferences, so we, we did this project where we were looking at community-based goals articulated in community resilience plans. And social was very high. Social resilience was extremely high. Um, and people define that in uh, several, several different ways, but there's actually a lot of consistency. So we have, I think, like uh, 17 or so different sort of goals. That, that came from that um, and jobs, access to, uh, you know, economies, local economies was, was a really big one. So I think um, what, what your observation is totally right. Yes, we need, you know, mandates for, uh, for how we build, but a lot of the system is already built, right? So what do we do with that? Um, I think one, one thing that, that you hit on that I think we're really not doing yet um, that, that I, th I think we need to start figuring out a little bit is with a lot of these programs um, that are great, uh, that are trying to achieve justice 40, the 40% investments or more, um, in disadvantaged communities, quote unquote, um, we still have some more thinking to do on how we make sure that those get to the most vulnerable individuals. And unfortunately, individuals are not measured <laughs> at the census block scale. They can move around, right? Um, and you can't, you know, absent tracking people over time really understand um, how that individual is benefiting or bettering, uh, getting better off. And one sort of, I think, opportunity for that is um, in these retrofit programs, in the housing buyout programs, sort of diving into some of those hairy subjects of like, how do we structure this so that maybe somebody that was spent a long time in a historically redlined community and that was their family's wealth, could they get an extra bonus if they decide to um, sell their home that's been flooded again and again and again and they move elsewhere so that they can actually um, be better off? You know, that's one example. I'm, I'm not sure it's a, a fix, but um, we don't, I don't think we're there yet. It's a great point. And that, that's... Uh, to the top of the hour, so you all are free for lunch, um, but also if you have ideas uh, that you can share with us to help uh, fix this problem or advocate, uh, please, please, uh, I don't know, Ben, did you miss uh, anything? Just a couple things. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Sorry, went a little rogue, but oh no, that's great. Just make sure. Um, no, so I have some things that I, that okay. I wanted to share. Could be later on. I've been working on um, air quality measurement and communicating that at the local level to our community. Getting ready for more than a resiliency hub there. Um, I would love to um, learn more about the tools and methods for resiliency accounting. Um, We're working on a large project there. I can definitely give you a card and sure. you could reach out and like just it, squeeze it, it out. It actually makes sense. Uh, so my, my email is just my first letter oh, and then okay. last name yeah. at edf.org. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Very cool. I'm, I'm a big fan of Red Hat. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.